I'm going to ask you to grab your Bibles and turn to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, and we're going to be looking at verses 12. Not verses 12, verse 12. And we're going to be looking at the light of the world. If you don't have a Bible, we have plenty. We would love for you to have one in your hands. Just put your hand up. We'll bring it to you. If you don't have a copy of God's Word at home, take that as our gift to you. John 8, verse 12, the light of the world. I want to welcome you back to the Bible here this morning, back to God's holy word for us today, as we desperately need to hear a message from the Lord. We desperately need to hear a message from the Lord and not from man. So John chapter 8, we're going to look at just verse, uh, verse 12 here this morning where we're going to see and we're going to hear Jesus say so powerfully, he's going to say, I am the light of the world. And as we hear even right now him make this incredible claim in such a powerful way, and we can't wait to understand and apply what he's teaching here, as you likely notice, it seems that we're jumping over verses 1 to 11 Or even in chapter 7, the last verse in chapter 7. Verse 53 from chapter 7, and then verses 1 to 11. We're jumping over that. You may be wondering, what's going on here? Why aren't we going through these verses? What about this story about this woman who was caught in adultery in in chapter 8? I'm not sure, maybe you don't have that in your Bible, but... Many do. You may be thinking, well, maybe the pastor has lost his mind or just plain forgot what is clearly in your Bible. And to that I'll say, no, I haven't lost my mind. And yes, I I see it there in some copies of the Bible. It's not in my copy. But then I'll ask you, if it is there, do you see anything different about the text? Do you see maybe some brackets or maybe some double brackets? Maybe you see a footnote about this text. Who sees the text in their Bible? Okay, there's a fair number of you, yeah. Who sees some brackets? Maybe just maybe a footnote? Okay, awesome, okay. Well, let me just show you this. In, in the ESV, just before the text, so the English Standard Version, just before the text, what it says there, it says the earliest manuscripts do not include chapter 7, verse 53 to 8 to 11. And it's actually not even in my Bible. I just have, I just have that message there. Uh, maybe you have a new international version, and it might even say further, it says the earliest manuscripts and many other ancient witnesses do not have John 7, 53 to 8, 11. And some other versions might have other uh, alterations like that. Um, I believe the King James Version just has it in there. I don't know if the New King James um, has an update on that as well. But the reason that I'm not going to be preaching on John 7, 53 and into 8, 11, and I'm going to be just jumping to verse 12, is because these specific verses, although they may be printed in your Bible for reference, These verses are not the infallible and inspired word of God. They are carefully footnoted and bracketed in many of our Bibles, and it's done so precisely because scholars and theologians over the centuries, and as the NIV says also that ancient witnesses, meaning the early church fathers, do not include these verses in their own writings as part of the accepted canon, uh, it does not meet the standard of what is inspired scripture. This is similar to the ending of the gospel of Mark in chapter 16, verse 9 to 20. Remember when we went through Mark, we did not preach that text. We mentioned it, but we did not preach that. So this text, although very memorable and even much loved, friends cannot and should not be considered as a legitimate part of God's breathed out Holy Spirit written scripture. So that, might, that may be confusing, as maybe you've maybe heard a sermon preached from that text before, or maybe as it shows up in your old King James Version without any footnotes, 
it, it, it is confusing, okay? So we're not here to, um, for you to be second-guessing what's in the Bible, but we just want to be careful, uh, and especially as your Bible notes, that this was not in the early manuscripts and why we don't consider it Scripture. So I'm, I'm just going to focus on this in the intro, then we're going to get to verse 12. And so the reasons for omitting this section are as follows. Number one, number one, as the footnote in your Bible might say, the earliest manuscripts do not include this text. Friends, as the reliability and the veracity and the authenticity of your Bible relies heavily on the testimony of the earliest manuscripts, what's revealing is that the earliest manuscript evidence we have does not include this text. They just don't. No, the, the very respected theologian Don Carson, by the way, he's a Canadian, Don Carson says, these verses are present in most of the medieval Greek minuscule manuscripts later, right? But they are absent from virtually all early Greek manuscripts that have come down to us. And so as the definition of biblical inerrancy means that the scriptures are inerrant in their original writings, that means their original autographs and the copies that are close to those autographs, friends, in the original earliest manuscripts, they do not include this text. Therefore, they cannot be considered part of the inerrant word of God. No, in fact, these verses only started showing up some 400 years after the original authorship. Second reason we're not going to include it is because even in those later editions, the verse shows up in different places. One manuscript has it coming right after verse 36. Another puts it uh, coming after verse 44. Another puts it at the end of John's gospel. And even another, some of these manuscripts go so far as to put it to the end of Luke's gospel. Which just in the inconsistency alone just reveals its inauthenticity as the copyists of scripture obviously didn't know where to put it. And so, therefore, it's unreliable. In fact, when we go to reason three here, we, we don't consider it Scripture because it doesn't even fit within the flow or the style of the Gospel of John. That as it is abruptly just seems to be out of place between chapter 7 and 8, what you see actually when you go through the, the, this section of John, verse 12 just so naturally comes right after uh, chapter 7, verse 52. It just flows and then with that also, we see that the language being used here in the style, it doesn't match up with the rest of John's gospel. John Piper says that its style and vocabulary is more like the rest of John's, or sorry, is more unlike the rest of John's gospel than any other paragraph in the gospel. So it's not Johanning, it's not of John, it doesn't even have the marks of John. And then fourthly, we see that no early church father even cites this passage before the 10th century. So there's some more things we could talk about as well, but what we have to deduce is that it doesn't meet the test of Scripture. It's not from John. It's not apostolic in authorship. It's not found in the early manuscripts or even referred to as Scripture by the early church fathers. Therefore, friends, it's not Scripture. Okay? It may be a historical event, for sure, and, and, and many believe that this was, and that's why it was so loved. It was, it was an oral tradition that was passed around. But as the Lord Jesus commanded his apostles and those after him to feed his sheep, to tend to his flock, and as Peter himself instructs the church to preach what? To preach the word in season and out of season. We're not going to preach this text. Paul says in, in 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And so as we don't believe that this was breathed out by God, we cannot preach it as the word of God. Therefore, we will not preach it. If you have any, any further questions about that, you can always ask. But you could also go and look into biblical textual criticism. Uh, you can go to the study notes in your Bible to find out more. You can grab a commentary to help explain further. But as most Orthodox scholars agree on this, we will not preach it as Scripture. Okay. So I hope that helps you understand how to approach this text and also explain why we're not going to preach it. Which then, finally, after all of that, little lesson this morning... After that long explanation, this brings us back to the continuation of the incredible inspired text found in verse 12. 
the text that I am overjoyed to preach to you today, which says, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We praise the Lord for his holy and inspired word. Brothers and sisters, the light of the world has come to expel our deadly darkness and shine forth eternal life. Let's pray. Our God, we're so thankful for your word that you by your Holy Spirit moved among men, among the men that you have chosen to write your very scripture and you wrote your scripture, that all scripture is breathed out by you. And so when we do our our study and we find things that are inconsistent, uh, we, 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 we pray for you to bless our time together, but also to help us understand how your scripture has come together as the very holy word of God that you have preserved for the ages. We do pray this morning as we look to the Son, as we look to Jesus Christ, as he says he is the light of the world. Our God, we need the light of the world in our world that is dark, in our hearts that are prone to darkness, prone to wander, prone to sin. God, we need, we need the light of the world at all times. And so we pray today as, as we look at this verse closely and apply it deeply that you would do the work that only you can do. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The light of the world has come to expel our deadly darkness and shine forth eternal life. Well, friends, as we left off last week with that that resonating testimony from the temple guards who said about Jesus that no one ever spoke like this man. And then as Nicodemus, a Pharisee of all people, came to Christ's defense, arguing that the Pharisees should at least hear from him and learn from him before they arrest him. What we see here is that the natural flow of Christ's teaching in the temple, as it continues on that last day of the festival, it continues into verse 12, where The scripture says, again, Jesus spoke to them. Spoke to who? Spoke to the Pharisees. Spoke to the chief priests. The temple leadership at that time and anybody with an earshot. The temple priests and the Pharisees, they were the ones who were hunting him down. The same ones who wanted him dead. The same ones who rejected his Messiahship and who determined, as we studied last week, that no prophet would ever come out of Galilee. They're going to do whatever they can to keep any kind of profit from coming out of Galilee from verse 52 from last week. The ones to whom verse 12 says, again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, in light of this understanding of a prophet coming from Galilee, the the, the Messiah coming from Galilee, he says in response to them, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world, which... By the way, that this is the second profound I am statement of Christ in the Gospel of John. It's the second of those ego a me statements, tying his personhood directly to God. And as he identifies with the Lord as the Lord, what he reveals to the hearing crowds and directly to the Jewish leaders is that as he is the Son of God and God himself, he is the I am. What they desperately needed to hear in that very moment was that Jesus claimed to be the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Now, what does that mean? What does light of the world mean? Why does it matter? I mean, just think about this term, light of the world. It gets used in church all the time. Maybe you grew up singing that song that I sang growing up, Here I Am to Worship, right? How do the lyrics go? Light of the world, you stepped down into darkness, opened my eyes, made me see. Right? Or we sing in the song, In Christ Alone, how in verse 3 it says, There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Friends, as Jesus declares that he is the light of the world, the title he's claiming, it's not just something we've artistically given him. It's not just lyrics. 
It's not just something that man compares him to. No, light of the world is one of those profound, great I am godly statements that the Jewish people and their leaders shouldn't ignore. And they must respond to it. And friends, the way that they ought to respond to Jesus is going to be our first point here today, which is that we must behold the light. He is the radiant glory we've all been waiting for. Friends, as we remember the context of Jesus' teaching in the temple here, we remember that at this time, the Feast of Booths was at hand in Jerusalem. This was the annual celebration of Israel's salvation from Egypt. And how during this feast, there were many symbolic activities going on that were reflecting upon the exodus. And these are being observed in remembrance of God's salvation. Remember, there was the building of the tent-like structures. Those are symbolically reminding them of how their ancestors camped out with God in an exodus in the wilderness. He was guiding them. They were with them. They lived in tents. We also saw from last week in the background, there was a a pouring out of water ceremony on the altar in the temple, as we heard about last week. Remember, that was tied to the striking of the rock in the desert for water. The New Testament says the rock was Christ. The background for how Jesus talked about these rivers of of flowing water that are going to flow out of us, but it's the Holy Spirit that he's going to give as he goes away. And then today, as we hear about him claiming to be the light of the world, what we have to know is that along with the booth symbolism and along with the water symbolism, another big part of the festival was light symbolism. That as the festival would begin with the lighting of these lampstands in the temple compound. I, got a, I have a picture of the temple. It's a little bit fuzzy. We could put up there. Uh, in, the, in the court there, I put a red box around it just to help. In the court of the women, there are four massive lampstands located there. And at the start of the festival, on top of those pillars are big bowls full of oil. And they would light those bowls at the start of the, of the festival. And it, and it would shine forth upon the whole temple compound. It could be seen across the city. It could be seen for miles and miles for everybody to see. And they did that to ultimately remind the people of the glory of God who guided their ancestors in the wilderness. As it says in Exodus 13, verse 21, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day And by night. And so those four massive lampstands were found in the middle of the court of the women. The court of the women, by the way, was also known as the treasury. Which, by the way, if you look down to verse 20 in chapter 8, what does it say? What what it reveals to us is this is exactly where Jesus was declaring that he is the light of the world. John 8, verse 20 says, These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And so he's, he's in the temple of the women. It, it's not a temple just for women. It was the temple, uh, or sorry, it was the courtyard where the, the women were not allowed beyond that. And so it was the temple of, or the courtyard of the women. He's standing in the courtyard in the shadow of these four lampstands, lampstands. And he's powerfully declaring that he is the light of the world. In fact, at the time that Jesus would be standing there on the last day of the festival, those 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 lampstands would be snuffed out. They would no longer be giving light. And he'd be saying, under the shadow of these snuffed out lampstands, he's saying, I am the light of the world. Leon Morris comes, he says, in the absence of the lights, Jesus' claim to the light would stand out all the more impressively. And so what we see with bread of life and living water, what we see is that Jesus is really driving his point home to the Jewish people. He is the I am. He is the glory of God in the flesh. He is the light that guides the way in the wilderness. He is the light that the whole world has been waiting for. 
And so, friends, as you can see how the setting and the con- context tease up Christ's statement here, what you can see so powerfully, again, is that Jesus isn't just a man from Galilee. He's not just a carpenter's son from Nazareth. He's not just a prophet of prophets. He's not just a great rabbi, a good teacher. He is the very fulfillment of the glory of God that was witnessed in the Exodus. He is the eternal pillar of fire by night that gives light to his people. And that as the Jews would follow that light, and as that light would save them from their enemy, and even as you and I read this on this side of the empty cross and the open grave, friends, we get to behold the radiant glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. That not only were the Jews waiting for this, the whole world has been waiting for the light of the world. Now, as John had already taught pretty extensively in chapter 1 about Jesus being the light, he already front-loaded his gospel with this theology. In John chapter 1, verse 9 to 10, what did he say? He said, the, tr- the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. And the reason that he was coming into the world was so that the world would know him, that they would believe in him, the whole purpose of this book, right? But the problem that the world faces and the main obstacle that you and I all face in our sin is that we don't naturally want to know him. We don't naturally want to know God. We don't naturally want to know Jesus. No, as verse 10 to 11 would go on to say, about Jesus, who would say he was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. That he came to his own, and his own people, the Jewish people, the ones who should more readily know about him, they did not receive him. And so friends, as it goes with us as well, this is our plight. That the greatest need for anyone and the greatest need for the Jews, the greatest need for the whole world is to know that Jesus is the light of the world. And that he is the only true light. Friends, there are many false gods, false lights. There are many false religions. And they all try to claim to be the light. Even the devil himself, what does he do? He masquerades as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. But friends, there is only one true light. Just as John said about Jesus in the beginning of his gospel again in verse 9, he says the true light, right? Not the false light, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world to everyone. Not just the Jews, but to everyone. Friends, we need to be careful. There is a lot of false light out there. There's a lot of fake light. There's a lot of counterfeit light. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm one of those people that in our new green age with these new fluorescent bulbs and these new LED lights, their light just seems to be so unnatural. It seems to be blue, cold, flickery, pulsing, so artificial in comparison to real natural light from the sun. I hate artificial light. Sometimes I'll work in my office with the with the lights off and just the light from the window coming in, or I'll be in the kitchen or the bathroom with just the natural light from the window coming in to the point that my my wife comes and says, hey, you're in the dark again. I do this because real natural light from the sun is so superior to the artificial light. Friends, artificial, counterfeit, false light in God's economy, it only brings forth death. We all desperately need the real eternal light of the world himself. It's the light that the whole world has been waiting for. You wonder why in this world there's so many religions. In their heart, they're all looking for the true light. But apart from the revealed will and word of God, they cannot find the true light. You can only find the true light right here in the word of God himself, Jesus Christ. He is the light the whole world has been waiting for. So you look at all of our continents, all of our people, all of these world religions. There is only one way 
to truly see, and that is from the very light of the world, Jesus Christ. And so as Jesus is standing under the shadow of those four massive lampstands, which at the festival, again, was to remind them of the radiant saving glory of their powerful God, as Jesus declares that he is the light of the world. Friends, he sang to his people. He sang to the Jewish leaders. He sang to us. He sang, I am the light for which those lampstands point. I am the powerful glory that led you out of Egypt. I am the light that you followed across the Red Sea and into the wilderness. I am the very glory of God who saved you. I am the I am. I am the light of the world. Which is just as the prophet Isaiah prophesied, right? Towards the coming of Christ in in Isaiah 9-2. What did he say? He said, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. So brothers and sisters, are you beholding the light of the world? He is the radiant glory that we've all been waiting for. And so friends, as beholding his light is the first critical step, merely beholding his light is not enough. No, if you're truly beholding, if you're truly believing, truly seeing Jesus as the light of the world for which he is, the next critical step is to follow that light. As the light of the world has come to expel our deadly darkness and shine forth eternal light. Friends, to respond to the light is to follow the light. He is the only pathway out of our darkness. As Jesus says, I am the light of the world, he then says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. Brothers and sisters, I don't think it's going to take much convincing to tell you that you are living in a dark and an ever-darkening world. It doesn't take a lot of convincing to tell you that the days are growing more and more evil. In the times when Christ was walking the earth, it was dark. Christ was walking in dark times. If you follow his life throughout the Gospels, what you see is is wherever humanity is, darkness is right there close at hand. For example, you would see that in the way that the people at this time had so much prejudice and so much hate for one another. We saw that earlier in John chapter 4 with the Samaritan woman, right? There was so much hate between the Jews and the Samaritans. Darkness. In John 4, 9, the Samaritan woman says to Jesus, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? And then there's some some contextual notes there from the Apostle John. He says, For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Hate. Darkness. They had a long history of despising one another. Another example of darkness of the world during those those days was revealed through the amount of suffering and disease and depravity that the people were experiencing on the streets of Jerusalem and elsewhere. Right? We already witnessed in this book the paralytic. How many years did he spend on the edge of that pool? He spent 38 years on a mat on the edge of the pool of Bethesda. And he did that with many other invalids, hoping for those waters to stir so that they can be healed. When you think about that place, it wouldn't have been a pretty place. It would have been a dark place. It's not a place you would want to hang out. It's kind of like some of the areas in our city. And especially in some other cities where people are living on the streets in squalor and squalor and filth and depravity. Abusing substances, suffering, mental issues, health issues. Uh, Kim and I were recently in Seattle a few weeks ago. Friends, the the street situation in in Seattle is just horrible. There's some 40,000 people living on the streets of Seattle. Since since COVID, that number has has doubled there's an the opi, op, opioid crisis is, is a big part of it. There's a lot of abuse. There's a lot of mental problems. There's a lot of crime. There's people lying all over the streets, overdosing, panhandling, camped all over the city, everywhere you turn. 
And as much as we need to have compassion for him, there is a level of darkness that is being witnessed that I've, I've, I've never seen before. And so back in Jesus' day, this was happening back then as well. There was also a lot of darkness within the temple. There was a corrupt Jewish religious system where the, the temple would squeeze two mites from a widow who had nothing. A time when the high priestly families were growing exceedingly rich off of the proceeds they were skimming off the temple offerings. It was their own version of the prosperity gospel scoundrels that you see today. And then he'd also see the rampant influence of demons and Satan possessing and tormenting people at every turn. Friends, the times of Jesus were dark, dark days. And so you see that throughout the whole Bible since the fall. And God flooded the earth because it was only wicked all the time. And so we see that as well in our own times as the days are getting darker and darker. Not to mention, not to mention as well, the darkness that we can see in our very own hearts. In our very own minds. We're prone to covet, we're prone to to jealousy, we're prone to hate, we're prone to despise, we're prone to sin, and we're prone to even the darkest of sins. Oh, friends, just think about ways that in your thoughts and in your actions, you have stooped to such wicked darkness in your life. Think about even now in moments of weakness or temptation, you can have such depraved thoughts. Friends, the human heart and mind, ever since the fall, is just so naturally dark. Jeremiah 17, 9, and you don't see this on many coffee mugs today, it says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Romans 1, 21 says, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were what? They were darkened. And then again, we see in Ephesians 4.18, where Paul says, they are darkened in their understanding. They are alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. Friends, as much as we might look to the darkness that presents itself throughout the world around us, we need not look further than our very own hearts and look into the mirror, into the depths of our own depraved souls. And we need to see the darkness of who we naturally are. Darkness, friends, is a sign of judgment. Darkness is what we naturally loved. As John already said in chapter 3, verse 19 to 20, he said, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Friends, before Christ, your works were evil. You loved the darkness. In fact, you hated the light. Verse 20, for everyone who does wicked things hates the light, doesn't come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. And so friends, as we look at the dark world and as we peer into our own sinful dark hearts, what we need to hear and what we need to be reminded of again and again is that this is exactly why Christ had to come. And this is why Christ came. That again, as Isaiah prophesied, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. Friends, the light of the world has come down to shine into our darkness in order to save a world that is so entranced by the darkness. Jesus came to save you, not because you were so lovable, or because he needed you. No, he saved you precisely because you are wicked. He saved us to free us from our darkness so that we could walk in the light with him. And friends, the only way to respond to such love, such grace, such pursuit, to such a savior, is to just drop everything and follow him. To put down that heap of sin and to turn away from it, right? That's the word repent. 
and to follow him out of your darkness. To follow him out of your darkness and into his glorious light. Because friends, in your darkness, if you remain in your darkness, that's what's waiting for you. Darkness is waiting for you, but it's going to be darkness times a billion. The Bible talks about outer darkness. This is one of the ways that the Bible describes hell. The language is outer darkness. We see this three times in Matthew's gospel. Jesus talks about sinners, unrepentant sinners, being thrown into the outer darkness. And he says, in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Three times. Friends, if you think your darkness is bad now, the thoughts of spending forever in an an eternity of hellfire and suffering in the outer darkness with unending weeping and the gnashing of teeth, this ought to cause you the most ultimate fear and sorrow and anxiety right now. If you are unrepentant of your sin. Friends, all that darkness breeds is just more darkness. And it ultimately breeds eternal darkness. Friends, it is a darkness that is so deserved. Because as our natural bent is to love the darkness and to love sin over the light, if you haven't bent the knee yet, if you haven't bowed your heart before God as of yet and pleaded with him, God, save me. Save me from my darkness. Save me from my sin. I know that it is an offense that is worthy of eternal outer darkness. If you you haven't done that, today is the day of salvation. Can't wait. Your faith, men, is not your wife's faith. You need to have that time right now with the Lord. And and, and ladies, your faith is not your husband's faith. You need to have that. Children, you need to have that faith for yourself. You stand alone before the Lord. This doesn't have to be your fate. You don't have to go to the outer darkness. No, that's why Jesus says, I am the light of the world. That's why he says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. So friends, follow him today. Repent of your sin. Follow him today. Stop following the course of this world. Stop following the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2. Stop in your darkened tracks right now. Turn to the light. Follow the light, whoever you are. Follow the light of the world. He's the only way out of our darkness. He's the only way out of your darkness. His, and, his, and his promise to you His promise is that you will no longer walk in darkness. He says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. In the new life of Christ, you were set on a new trajectory. You were given a new path. And your path is lit and it is led by pure, radiant glory. Jesus Christ himself. As you follow him, even though as you grow in this, you're going to grow in no longer loving the darkness as you once did. You're now going to love the light as you ought to. Your ways will no longer be in bondage to the darkness, but you will be set free from the darkness to live in the light. Just as the Israelites followed the glory of God in the pillar of fire, who was their light? Friends, they escaped what? They they escaped the bondage and the slavery of Egypt by following the light out of their darkness. And so as Jesus stands in the courts of the treasury under those massive lampstands, what he's telling the Jewish leaders and what he's telling the people, and he's speaking to you as well, is that we desperately need to follow him. Follow his radiant glory. Friends, this is the hope of the world. This is the only hope of the world. You know, as I mentioned, the homeless in the street situation that I witnessed in Seattle, how dark it was. 
And how we are often tempted to, to, to look at that situation and to wonder, how can we help these people? They're too far gone. We have to stop thinking that way. But just as Jesus says right here, he says, if they follow him, they will not walk in darkness. Friends, that's the gospel of Jesus. That's the powerful gospel of Jesus. That is the power to save anyone from their darkness. That goes for anybody that you know. That goes for any of your family members, any of your children, your parents. That goes for any nation, anybody lost in counterfeit gospels and false religion. What they need is that true light. And so as we are also called children of light, and as we are to be following him, we ask ourselves, are we following him out of our darkness into the light? But we're also going to be looking at what does it mean to shine that light and to lead others out of the darkness, which leads to point three, which is this. We need to receive the light. He's the gracious giver of our eternal life. So again, from the top, Verse 12, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Friends, the light of life that Jesus promised for those who follow him is the light that produces more and more life. It is the light of eternal life. Friends, I know that I've said this before, but it must be said again. If you were a Christian, if you were truly following the light of the world, eternal life isn't something that you have to wait for. Eternal life is something that you have right now. It's something you you get to live right now. That's why Jesus says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have. It's a conditional clause. That means that if you're following, you have it. The world doesn't know this. Having it is what we have right now in Jesus Christ. This is a promise. He will give it. You will have it. Friends, are you living that life right now? Are you living as if you have eternal life right now, because you do, if you're following the light. This isn't something that you're just waiting around for. It doesn't just come after you die or after Christ returns. Are you living the eternal life right now? That means that we're not just here to live for temporary pleasures. We're here to live for eternal glory right now. That, you're, that you're, you're not just living for the next best thing, but you're living for the greatest thing. Christ, the light of the world right now. That you're celebrating and you're glorifying with such joy and such gratitude right now because you are forever safe and you are forever secure right now and for all eternity. Are you living to walk in the light Are you living to be continually transformed by the light right now? Friends, as the light of life is light that produces more life right now, are you living to be transformed? Are you living to be sanctified more and more into the radiant image of Jesus Christ? Right? The exact imprint of the glory of God. Paul says a lot about this, about how light is connected to this in glory. He says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, he says, and, and this is so connected back to the Exodus, Moses and the Shekinah glory of God. 2 Corinthians 3.18, and we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of God, are being transformed into the same Im- image from one degree to another. You're changed, you're transformed by beholding the glory of God. Friends, Jesus didn't come just to rescue you from the darkness. He came to transform you from one degree of glory to another. And he does this as we follow and receive. 
and as we behold his glory, that as God first began our universe, as Christ created by the very power of his word, as he first began to create the universe, what did he create first? Let there be light. That same light-creating God is all about recreating his light in us to change us into the image of his son. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, creation has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And friends, as the light of life is about producing more life in us, God also intends for us in his light to produce his light in life. In others. He does that through us. He does that, yes, through his word by his spirit, but he sends us. He sends us with the light of the world message. Friends, we exist to proclaim the good news of the light of the world to the world. It's not just our light, it's not just the light of Redemption Church, Calgary South, or just the light of the church. It is the light of the what? The world, the world needs to hear this. Peter says to us in 1 Peter 2, 9, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession that that we might do what? You may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you from where? Who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Friends, the light of the world has come to expel our deadly darkness and to shine forth his eternal life. He comes to to the world in its darkness. It's not about us trying to shine ourselves up first. We can't clean ourselves up first. For while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ came for us. He came into the darkness to bring us into his Marvelous lights. Friends, we need to go and stand and proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of our darkness and into his marvelous light. And so as we are a church on mission, as all in the church are to be about the good news, as we all have been sent, are you proclaiming his excellencies to the world? Are you proclaiming the excellencies of Christ to your children? Right? That's so important. Primary discipleship in your life. Disciple your kids to the glory of God in the marvelous light of God. Are you shining the light of his excellencies, the light of the world to your husbands, ladies? Are you shining that light to them? Are you husbands shining the light of the world? To your wives? Are you proclaiming the good news of the light of the world to the world, to the darkness that's in your place of work or your place of school, wherever you go? The darkness in our city, the darkness in our province, in the country, into the ends of the earth. And are you trusting the Lord's light to grow life where once there was only death? To spread the light where once there was only darkness. To produce worship where once there was only hate and rebellion. Oh, friends, as Jesus stood beneath those lampposts in the temple proclaiming, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Friends, this is what produces eternal life from the very gracious giver himself of life. The eternal life that begins right now for those who truly behold him, for those who truly follow him, for those who have the light of life. Amen. Behold the light. He's the radiant glory we've all been waiting for. Follow the light. He's the only pathway out of our darkness. Receive the light. He's the gracious giver of our eternal life. Let's pray. Our God, as we, we think about Christ and these powerful words in, in the temple 
under the shadow of the lampstands, the snuffed out lampstands that were originally lit to remind the people of the saving, radiant glory of God. Friends, our God, we, we confess Jesus is that radiant glory that saves us from our sins. He is the light of the world. And as we meditate upon this as we walk into this next week and as we we aim to remind each other of this to to preach the gospel to ourselves and to go out and to share this good news in the whole world that we confess that we are nothing apart from your light apart from the saving light of jesus christ may this just produce so much more worship in us may this produce even now for even seasoned christians just more repentance as we even look into our hearts and see the darkness that sometimes still remains. That like the Israelites in Egypt wanted to, or in, in the Exodus wanted sometimes to return to Egypt. Sometimes we want to return to our own sin and our own darkness. The old man rises up. May, may he be killed. The old man that rises up in, within us. And may we return always to the marvelous light. We pray for you to continue to work in us that you would grow us in sanctification, that you would renew our minds and transform our hearts and change our ways, that we would bring you glory, glory for the light of the world. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.